historic and unlikely place. We are a National Archives facility. We're one of 13 presidential libraries in the presidential library system. And today we're going to be talking about bootleggers, flappers, and gangsters, and how prohibition kind of created this entire culture of lawlessness and some other problems. And we'll see kind of uh, the problems that Hoover faced in, in making this. So President Hoover um, comes in after the 18th Amendment was passed. It was ratified January 17th, 1920, and they passed a series of laws after that, one of which was called the Volstead Act. Um, it was the result of decades of work by more than 20 different temperance organizations in the United States, including the Anti-Saloon League, also known as the ASL, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU, um, and much of the movement was related to women in response to the epidemic of alcoholism and its associated spousal abuse, family neglect, and chronic unemployment. One of the things that the women talked about when they were fighting in for temperance was that men would often take money that was reserved for their families and they would spend it on alcohol um, and they would lose their jobs and, and of course, you couldn't pay for your home and stuff like that if you didn't have money. At 12.01 a.m. January 17, 1920, it became illegal to produce, transport, or sell intoxicating beverages anywhere in the United States, and we called this prohibition. The ratification of the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution in January 1919 and the passing of the National Prohibition Act, known as the Volstead Act, made it illegal to produce or transport or sell, um, and it effectively closed every single bar, tavern, and saloon in the country. And if you guys remember, um, shortly after Hoover takes office, one of the big concerns in the United States is a declining economy, and some people see the 18th Amendment as one of the reasons that the economy is not looking so good. The amendment worked at first. Uh, liquor consumption dropped, arrest for drunkenness fell, and the price for illegal alcohol rose higher than the average worker could afford. So let's bring Herbert Hoover into our discussion now. So in the 1928 election, um, there's some things going on, and one of the big concerns is who's going to enforce prohibition. Um, politicians were often labeled as wet or dry, depending on if they supported or did not support the 18th Amendment. Um, and not just the amendment, but the laws that were surrounding its enforcement. Uh, during the campaign of 1928, Hoover supported prohibition and promised more effective enforcement of the laws. One of the big criticisms of prohibition is that it was not being enforced. And so there was a large segment of the U.S. population that was really rallying around the idea of supporting law enforcement. Hoover recognized that the lax enforcement created and fostered an environment that permitted the growth of organized crime. And now we're starting to see the birth of people who are selling alcohol and becoming gangsters, and we're going to look at that throughout the presentation today. In his inauguration speech, Hoover called for better enforcement, a reform of the criminal justice system, and he blamed citizens for not following the laws. Hoover said, and I quote, a large responsibility rests directly upon our citizens. There would be little traffic in illegal liquor if only criminals patronized it. And what that means is that he was saying that if the average citizen wasn't buying and consuming alcohol, prohibition um, wouldn't be violated at such an astonishing rate, that it was everyday citizens who were violating the 18th Amendment, not just criminals. So Hoover looks at establishing um, the Wickersham Commission. And the Wickersham Commission was set up to enforce these laws. In May of 1929, President Hoover appointed George Wickersham to head the National Commission on Law Observance and Enforcement, also known as the Wickersham Commission. In 1929, there's no Miranda protections. 
Now, we know Miranda protections, if you ever watch police shows, it's when they say, you have the right to remain silent, anything you say can will be used against you in a court of law, so on and so forth. And basically what they're doing is they're telling criminals, these are your rights as American citizens because you're innocent until proven guilty. And also it um, prevents the police from beating criminals up and making them confess to things or um, accused criminals, I should say. Um, but the uh, Wickersham Commission discovered instances of police inflicting pain, physical or mental, to extract confessions or statements in absence of Miranda protection. Um, and that police mistreatment of citizens was widespread. Towards the end of the commission's tenure, the commission reported in 1931 that the people did not want prohibition, enforcement was too difficult, and corruption was too widespread. The report also publicly scorned police for not catching and arresting criminals. Franklin P. Adams, a columnist for the New York World, summarized his opinion of the Wickersham Commission's report with this poem. Prohibition is an awful flop. We like it. We can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of graft and slime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. It don't prohibit worth a dime, nevertheless we're for it. And graft um, is something we should talk about because that's, or graft is something we should talk about because it's a weird uh, vocabulary word like we, like your teachers like to tell you. But graft is where you could pay off government officials to get away with stuff. So often it was the police that were being paid under the table to look the other way so that gangsters and crime could continue to spread without arrest. So as this is coming out, because this is the Presidential Primary Source Project, and we want to look at some of the primary sources that are attached to this, um, this is actually really, really interesting. And this happened a lot to President Hoover when he was the president. A letter comes in from the NAACP and that stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And it's on the left-hand side of your screen. And basically what this letter says is that African-American citizens are being disproportionately affected by crime and arrested by the police. And what they ask is that a prominent member of the African-American community be appointed to the new National Law Enforcement Commission. Um, and this kind of falls on deaf ears. Um, Hoover uh, was a Quaker and absolutely supported equality and movements towards equality, but he also did not like to disrupt the Southern Democrats, and especially because a lot of him had, them had just recently voted for him. And at this time in the 20s and even into the 30s, Jim Crow laws are enacted all through the South, and those were groups that had supported Hoover in the 1928 election for the first time since before Reconstruction. So it's really important that um, he keeps him happy and he doesn't address this. And because African Americans aren't participating in that graft that I had just talked about, they're not pay able to pay off police and government officials, um, they're the ones that are being arrested instead of some of the more prominent criminals that we'll talk about in a few minutes. On the right is a letter from uh, an individual from 1929 that's talking about how they want to divide prohibition enforcement between states and the federal government. And the federal government was reluctant to get involved in prohibition um, enforcement because it would take a lot of the resources away, but they were also intent on keeping government small and giving more power to the states, <clears throat> because that's one of the tenets of President Herbert Hoover's um, philosophies towards smaller and more efficient government. So I want to look at um, bootleggers, because bootleggers are interesting. Bootleggers aren't really our organized uh, gangsters that we'll talk about in a few minutes, but they're really our everyday people uh, who are hired by the mob uh, 
to push alcohol through the country. And they start getting really creative in how they're moving alcohol uh, because they know they're being followed by, at first by state agencies and then ultimately by federal agencies. So you see the truck in the picture here. They found creative ways to hide the contents of their vehicles. So this one looks like it's hauling wood, but it has a false door because it's full of alcohol. Um, bootleggers would move alcohol through woods and they knew that they would be followed. So they had attachments for the bottom of their shoes that looked like hooves. So as they were going through the woods, it would leave hoof prints like horses or like deer instead of footprints like what bootleggers would have. So they called uh, alcohol then hooch. It was the, the term for alcohol, or we called it bathtub gin, where you could cook the alcohol in your bathrooms at home. Um, they would move into speakeasies, which is where a lot of bars operated kind of illegally and behind the scenes. Um, but they generated large sums of money, and it was mostly paid to the gangsters in the different parts of the country. And this is how they start to build their organized crime ring. Well, let's take a look at these speakeasies in America and who is going to these. Take a second and just think about who do you think is going to speakeasies where there's illegal alcohol use, there's also probably illegal um, drug use, there's gambling going on, which is also illegal, uh, prostitution, which is also illegal, and there, people are looking for them, uh, federal agents and state agents. So just in your mind, you think that it's criminals that are going to these places. And it's not. It's, it's everyday people. Um, they're gathering here where the alcohol, alcohol is being sold illegal, illegally. Speakeasy originates from the idea of having to speak quietly or selectively about these places. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, there's um, some eyes looking at you through a door. And when you would show up to a speakeasy, there was often a bouncer or a guard at the door, and he would ask you for an invitation. And sometimes that meant it was a secret word or a phrase that got you access to the speakeasy. Um, speakeasies in Chicago were known for painting their doors green to let you know that they had a speakeasy probably in the back part of their business. Um, they were largely operated by organized crime, so it's another way for the mob to make more money off of illegal alcohol consumption. But speakeasies became a part of American culture. It started to change the way um, women were in society, things that they did. Um, in some clubs, there was mixing of races, and I just told you that there was Jim Crow laws so it was kind of a big deal that African-American patrons were drinking and participating in social events alongside um, white people and people who were not African-American. Can you guys see me up here now? So one of the things that came out in speakeasies was the birth of jazz music. And this is a picture of Louis Armstrong. He was a really famous um, jazz musician. And jazz came to kind of be an icon of this time period of prohibition. And it was born from kind of ragtime music and blues. Uh, we talk about it being born in New Orleans, but also uh, it was really big in Harlem, in New York. Jazz music was cropping up everywhere. And so I want to play a few seconds of Louis Armstrong because music is a really powerful primary source. So we can hear what this jazz music sounded like. 
had words, sometimes he didn't have words. Louis Armstrong was a famous trumpet player. He also sang on his tracks, and he kind, kind of became an icon of jazz music. And if you ever get down to New Orleans, they have great um, Louis Armstrong Museum down there. We had some of his stuff here at the Hoover this year during our um, gangster exhibit. Um, but jazz music was spreading through the country, and a lot of the the conservative group that followed Herbert Hoover really did not like jazz music. They thought about jazz music as one of the vices of prohibition, that it enticed people to be lawless and um, especially women to be kind of without morals. Um, and it was kind of unfortunate. Jazz music, of course, has turned into a very popular genre of music through through time and has definitely withstood the test of time. So let's talk about flappers because they also became an icon of the Prohibition time period and they were born out of this drinking culture and speakeasies. Now before Prohibition there was a kind of style of woman that we called Gibson girls and they wore big hats and long dresses and um, long sleeve shirts, high necks, they were still kind of left over from the more conservative Victorian time period. But we call them flappers. Um, authors such as F. Scott Fitzgerald and John Held Jr. first used the terms in the U.S., half reflecting and half creating the image and the style of the flapper. Fitzgerald described the ideal flapper as lovely, expensive, and about 19. Uh, Held accentuated the flapper by drawing young girls wearing unbuckled galoshes that would make a flapping noise when walking. And so many people have kind of tried to define this idea of what a flapper was, um, but basically it was a younger woman who drank alcohol unapologetically, went dancing, they liked jazz music. For the first time, they were cutting their hair short um, which is actually left over a little bit from World War I, um, but they decided to keep them short and start wearing tight curls and waves in their hair. They started wearing short dresses. And the dresses in the picture above are probably day dresses, so they're a little bit long, but the night dresses, um, kind of like the dresses you saw um, in the mannequins behind me, were shorter and showed knees, which was really scandalous. Knees and ankles were not something that proper Victorian women were showing. So it really challenged the idea of a woman's, um, I don't know, kind of how she presented herself to the public. Another thing that was popular in flapper culture was petting parties. And basically those were house parties where men and women were making out and just being, in terms of the 20s, we would call it promiscuous behavior. Um, flappers also voted, which terrified people, especially men, because they were they thought they had loose morals and they couldn't believe they were voting. Um, but they also drove cars, which was a new thing, and a lot of more um, reserved women did not drive cars. They got rides from from men where they walked. And so the idea of these women being so independent and liberated to drive cars was kind of a big deal uh, in society. Let's start talking about organized crime and gangsters. So society has done some interesting things to the, things to the idea of gangsters, right? They're kind of icons, they're almost celebrities. Um, in the 1920s, not so much. This is a picture of Al Capone up here. And Al Capone was interesting because he didn't consider himself a criminal. Uh, he thought he was a community man, that he gave money away, that he took care of people that worked for him. He was a businessman. Um, but his business was illegal. And he was a criminal, and at the end of the day, he was organizing um, murders and assassinations of competing gangs and mobs. Um, so Al Capone really should not be idolized. 
and even during his time period, he was idolized. We identify two types of gangsters, and the first one is the organized crime rings, um, and, and we look at them as mobsters. Um, mobsters such as Al Capone belonged to and ran large organized crime rings, were usually recent immigrants or first-generation Americans. They lived in urban areas and earned their money through illegal gambling, uh, prostitution, rum running, and illegal alcohol sales. They also bribed politicians and law enforcement personnel to avoid punishment. After 1929, mobsters became national in scope and greatly increased their power. The second type of gangster that we look at are outlaws. And up here on the screen, you see some different um, primary sources. Um, the first one on the left is a subpoena for one of these gangsters that we call outlaws is the second type. Outlaws such as John Dillinger or Bonnie and Clyde were American born, came from rural parts of the Midwest, Southwest, or West, and were robbers and kidnappers who became national celebrities as a result of their exploits. By 1935, most were killed or captured by the FBI. Regardless of the type of gangster, many were involved in horrendous crimes during the 1920s and 1930s, yet many overlook their crimes and idolize them to this day. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre was kind of the turning point in how the, view, the public viewed um, gangsters. Leading up to this point, even Al Capone had a comic strip, and you would catch them on newsreels, and the graft was so bad that they couldn't arrest organized criminals like Al Capone. But the outlaws like Bonnie and Clyde were doing really over-the-top things, shooting at police, being very public about it. Um, and Bonnie and Clyde were shot up by police. Their uh, vehicle was riddled with bullets. And to this day, that car is on tour um, around Las Vegas, typically, where you can see the death car of Bonnie and Clyde. So we still, as a culture, kind of idolize these type of criminals. But the St. Valentine's Day Massacre had a different effect on the public. Um, it had its roots in brothels due to a disagreement by gangsters Dean O'Banion's North Side Gang and Johnny Torrio's and Al Capone's Chicago Outfit Gang over control of who sold whiskey in different parts of Chicago. As compensation for some of Torrio's whiskey being sold in the North Side Gang territory, Torrio offered the proceeds from some South Side brothels. O'Banion refused as he abhorred prohibition. Around 10.30 on St. Valentine's Day, February 14, 1929, seven members of the Bugs Moran's gang were gunned down in cold blood in a garage in Chicago. The massacre orchestrated by Al Capone shocked the nation by its brutality. The St. Valentine's Day massacre remains the most notorious gangster killing of the prohibition era. The massacre not only made Al Capone a national celebrity, it also brought Capone the unwanted attention of the federal government. This was one of the first, time, first major crimes that the science of ballistics was used. However, no one was ever tried or convicted in the murder of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. The police never had enough evidence to convict Al Capone, but the public knew he was responsible. In addition to making Al Capone a national celebrity, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre brought Capone um, uh, in under the microscope, and he was eventually arrested for tax evasion in 1931 and was sent to Alcatraz. Um, Capone served some time in Alcatraz, but was uh, later released and died. He suffered from syphilis and became kind of senile uh, in his stint at Alcatraz. <clears throat> but it turned the public against him. Remember I said Cal uh, Capone saw himself as a businessman and someone who was doing things for the community, um, but this was the time that the public decided that he he was not a good guy, and they didn't they didn't want to all um, they did not want to lift him up as an idol any longer. So Hoover referred to prohibition as a noble experiment, and. There we go, I thought it went away. 
he referred to it as a noble experiment. <clears throat> um, and he said because he thought it would help to preserve families and it was an experiment because it failed. When the Great Depression settled in, people believed repealing prohibition would bring jobs back to the United States. When they go to <clears throat> the Republican National Convention in 1932, the issue of prohibition um, was kind of confused, confused by the Republicans, but it was also under the spotlight because the Republican National Convention was in Chicago. And that's where the gangs of Bugs Moran and uh, Al Capone were all operating out of. The Republican Party platform both supported prohibition and it approved exceptions to it. And this is where they confused the issue. Hoover maintained his support of prohibition through the 1932 campaign, um, and Democrats supported the repeal of the 18th Amendment. And that would be the party of FDR. And this was a really strong um, issue in the conventions of 1932. Um, ultimately, people supported FDR. Uh, some of it was prohibition. Uh, a lot of the rest of it was the economy, which was failing. Um, during Hoover's time, but ultimately prohibition was repealed. And in order to repeal a constitutional amendment, you have to pass another constitutional amendment. And uh, as we know, passing constitutional amendments is very difficult. Um, right now, the National Archives has an exhibit called Amending America. There's been over 11,000 attempts to amend the Constitution, and only 27 of those have actually passed. So the 21st Amendment passes December 5th, 1933, and it repeals the 18th Amendment. So the Democrats come in and change that back immediately. But there was a huge push from the people up to repeal the 18th Amendment. Um, it was seen as wasteful to continue to promote um, and enforce prohibition by the people, especially because they were suffering so much um, uh, under under Hoover and under the economy and, and the climate of the economy, but this really changed American culture moving forward. Um, alcohol was used during this time to create these mobs and organized crime rings, which we were still feeling the effects of. We were into our modern time period, uh, the mob was still operating, and they perfected the way that they were avoiding prosecution so much that they were still using some of the same tactics in crime clearance in the 80s and the 90s, and even probably arguably today. Um, but crime fighting and the way that we structure the FBI changed because of prohibition and organized crime. It is, there is now federal crimes units and federal law enforcement units because of prohibition and the peddling of illegal alcohol. Um, fingerprinting and fingerprint databases came out of prohibition along with ballistics, as we saw with the St. Valentine's Day massacre. So technology for fighting crime also changed uh, during this time. And it probably detracted a lot of people if they knew that they could be fingerprinted and caught or tied back to their criminal criminal acts. Um, what were its penalties if you broke? If you were found. If you found. Personal. That was part of the problem with prohibition. There wasn't very good enforcement. Um, if you got caught, you might get arrested and released. You might not get arrested at all. If you paid off a police officer or you paid off an elected official, you could get out of jail. And that was part of the problem with the gangsters and the organized crime kind of controlling alcohol. Um, so it was very difficult to, to enforce prohibition because so many people were breaking the law, they couldn't lock them all up. Or just selling it. Yeah, even just selling it, all of it was against the law. Making it was against the law. So they had to come up with really creative ways to get around the police. Um, yeah. We were talking about hiding where people made alcohol, that bootleggers would wear hooves, hoof molds on their shoes, 
So they could go through the woods and they would think it was a horse and not people. Um, and they would conceal the way they were transporting it in their cars. People would wear, like, make flasks and wear them inside their clothes so cops couldn't find it. And the speakeasies, where a lot of the alcohol consumption was happening, had locked doors and they were run by the mobs, so people were safe there while they were drinking alcohol. But um, enforcement was really a problem. It was very, very hard. Was it illegal even in churches for communion? Yes, it was. Uh, there's telegrams always that come into the president at this time because it's before email um, telling them, you know, if they support them, if they don't support them. And we get lots of these and lots of different reasons why they support and don't support um, prohibition or, or any issue that comes up during this time. It was kind of a nice exercise to have people look at why they supported prohibition and why they did not support it and discuss where we think most common ground could have been in dealing with the issue. And if you guys think of questions later, you can tweet them to us at hashtag PPSP17, um, seven, Katie, and then we uh, can... Yep, hashtag PPSP2017. Yeah, and then we can get back with you guys and I can answer questions, I can share documents, um, anything you might need and have questions about this. It's a really interesting time uh, in our history.